the President has made it very clear to those of us in the humanitarian agencies within the U.S. government that he wants us to do everything we possibly can to save lives and reduce human suffering in Syria. Um, there's been intense interest within the U.S. government on these issues. And so uh, we have been uh, responding to, to the greatest extent we can, given the resources we have. Uh, and resources, of course, are an issue, and I mentioned the size of the appeal. Uh, but the U.S. to date has put over $210 uh, million into humanitarian assistance in the region. Of that, about $140 million has gone inside of Syria. And that's going to grow as well. It's going to grow over the coming months. We have some 1,800 staff right now uh, just working uh, with partners from my office who are doing humanitarian assistance inside Syria. And they've created a network of field hospitals, of underground warehouses. Um, one of the problems has been with all this violence that doctors have either fled or been killed, so there's a huge shortage of medical personnel. So we've gone and we've trained over 3,100 uh, personnel in providing medical assistance. Now, it's everything from very basic first aid to over 500 uh, medical personnel who already had significant skills, um, training them on much more sophisticated sort of uh, triage surgery. Uh, and we're providing supplies. And the types of supplies are everything from surgical, surgical kits, uh, surgical beds, to more sophisticated things like mobile x-ray machines. Uh, we are, we've set up mobile medical clinics so that we can quickly move around the country and be as discreet as possible. Um, to date, We've reached over 410,000 Syrians uh, through these various people who've been trained in medical assistance. Through our surgeries, we've done over 20, almost 26,000 surgeries right now inside of Syria through our partners. So it's a very significant uh, contribution to the medical problem right now inside Syria. But the, the medical issues go far beyond just the emergency triage. As a crisis like this goes on year after year, it's been almost three years now, two years since the, the violence really started, um, you're starting to see problems like the fact that in Aleppo, which was the hub of uh, pharmaceutical production in Syria, it's been largely devastated. So you've seen a significant uh, diminution of the ability to, to provide pharmaceuticals in country. And so people who have chronic diseases, who have diabetes, who have cancer, haven't been able to get drugs. So that's something else we've been trying to do, is bring in pharmaceuticals uh, to provide people with chronic health care uh, needs. And then you have uh, one of the big worries in a crisis like this are children. Uh, displaced people at large, we know that when they're displaced from their homes, they're going to be far more susceptible to die of very simple diseases like diarrhea, like measles. And so we're doing large-scale vaccination programs. Uh, through USAID funding, a number of partners just vaccinated 639,000 children in Syria. And they had a fairly high rate of coverage prior to this conflict, but you're seeing that coverage go way, way down because of the crisis. So one of the things we're doing is focusing a huge effort right now on providing winterization supplies. And we have a product, it's plastic sheeting, which sounds uh, pretty, pretty weak, uh, but actually this is a really uh, significant type of plastic. It lasts about 10 years, and it can cover windows. Uh, it can make a big difference in making a building survivable over the winter. And with that plastic sheeting, we're providing thermal blankets, we're providing certain uh, specialized types of mattresses to keep people off the ground, clothing, especially for children, um, sometimes heating sources for some of these public buildings, wood stoves or some sorts of fuel stoves, but ways to just get people through the winter. Right now, we've reached about 500,000 people with winterization supplies inside Syria, and we're looking to do another 350,000 uh, by the end of this month. We've seen a significant amount of um, sexually based violence, rape against women in this crisis. And so we have some programs with women groups in Syria to try to address it. It's a very difficult issue inside Syria. It's an honor-based society. If a woman is raped, uh, it, it has, beyond the horror of the rape itself, it has huge consequences. So we're looking at uh, strategies to, to help these women. Also children. Uh, I mentioned uh, how children, children have been deliberately targeted in this crisis from the reports that we're receiving. And the level of trauma uh, is, is going to be severe. And we do uh, what sounds fairly simple, which are, we call them safe spaces uh, for children to play, but we have our experts that will be with them and observe them as they're playing and you'll be able to tell which children have more significant uh, levels of trauma that need professional help. Um, I've seen those programs before in, in the midst of some of the worst possible uh, war conditions, and they're, they're amazing, and they really can make a difference. 
uh, for the children and for, frankly, the, the parents who are having to suffer watching their children go through these types of crises. Typically, when the U.S. government is providing assistance, everything we send in virtually is branded. Uh, even that plastic sheeting has big USAID, gift of the American people on the side of it, but it's simply too dangerous to do that right now in Syria. So in many cases, they don't know. I was reading an article the other day uh, in the paper, I won't mention the paper, the national paper, and uh, it talked about a journalist was in a, an area and he said it was receiving no international aid beyond a few things from Turkey. And then he described a group that was in there. Well, it was one of our partners, but they've sort of changed their name a bit to uh, remain uh, <laughs> obscure. And so it's that kind of a situation. Uh, and it's, it's frustrating, I think, because so much is being done. And uh, at some level, our partners are informing uh, local officials that, yes, this is assistance being supported by the United States. Uh, but they have to be judicious about how they spread that information because uh, it is so uh, potentially dangerous to, to announce who you are and where it is coming from. We have messaging, and the messaging is cash is best uh, <laughs> because invariably you'll have uh, the desire to send commodities, clothing, I mean, it's cold, and by the time, or drugs, and the time it gets over there, uh, it costs so much more to get it in country that you would have been much better off sending cash. And pharmaceuticals are a particularly difficult one because they have an expiration date and they can be very expensive to dispose of. And frankly, most countries won't even allow them in because they find it so problematic. We have a, a full-time pharmacist on staff who um, actually arranges all these uh, um, um, pharmaceutical purchases with the countries where we are, we're purchasing pharmaceuticals and works out a system to ensure that it's viable what we're sending in. Um, but really, uh, especially in an international crisis, uh, cash is the way to go. And the office I mentioned is called CD, CIDI, and it's www.cidi.org. And there'll be a range of information on that site about how to effectively respond uh, to a crisis like this. There's also an umbrella organization in, in Washington called Interaction that has a number of non-governmental organizations uh, that are doing work in Syria and in the region. And uh, that would be another place to look if you wanted to send a, a donation to an organization that's already operational there. There certainly are lessons learned uh, in the community for, for responding in a war zone. And one of the things that we did early on is there was an opportunity. We could have done a lot more funding early on, and we didn't. And the reason we didn't is because we recognized uh, that the, the main needs were in these conflict areas. So until such time as we could gain access into those areas, which we now have, uh, we held back on our funding. Uh, and I think that was, that was the right move to make in terms of, because resources are scarce. And uh, I think you're seeing some other donors doing that still, and they're waiting for that data I mentioned before they pull the trigger and, and really start uh, ramping up in these areas.